before we start, I do want to give a very special word of thanks to the people that helped to make this uh, retreat happen. Uh, first of all, our, our team of event organizers, uh, Bill Watkins, Zach Trent, uh, Bill and Amy Lancaster, um, and uh, Nicole Morris as well. Thank you all very much. Also, the teens for providing child care. Wow. Uh, giving a lot of us adults the time to um, hear uh, in, in one piece of quiet for once. Wow. And then finally, and last but certainly not the least, with the Alejandro and Maria Gonzalez family in the kitchen doing a fantastic job. They're working too hard to even know that we're acknowledging them right now. There he is. Come on out. Come on out. Yeah. Come on out. Hey. Thank you. Very And just a quick housekeeping note too. Uh, we we do still have afternoon sessions as exciting as Father Stephen can be. Sometimes we can get a little sleepy. There's still coffee and other drinks and refreshments and so on just on the inside of the kitchen if you need to grab anything at any point. Now, wow. without further ado, I will again invite Father Stephen to come up. A little more. Good. If you're ready to stand. I, I'm totally, I'm totally ready. I'm, I'm just, this happens at so many places I speak where there's part one and part two. Um, and that is, I keep wondering what further ado would look like. So, uh, it's always without further ado, and uh, so much ado about nothing, that's another stuff. That would probably be better it. Uh, so it's good. Thank you for lunch. Do you want to sit on that stool? Or no, I'm, I'm going to stand. It uh, lets the power flow. Uh, anyway, as of, uh, the, the audio level's good back there? Yeah, okay, great, great. There's a video of this, so next week... Father Stephen the movie of uh, Taylor Swift did really well with her so uh, you know it's being these theaters coming out soon um, but anyhow I want to begin this talk which is going to be on the subject of Providence which is pretty scary uh, but uh, Providence father okay uh, but I'm going to begin it with a prayer that might be familiar for some of you. It's a very uh, common uh, prayer from the morning prayers. Uh, it's known as the morning prayer of the last elders of Optona Monastery. It begins, O Lord, grant that I may meet all that this coming day brings to me with spiritual tranquility. Grant that I may fully surrender myself to thy holy will. At every hour of this day, direct and support me in all things. Whatsoever news may reach me in the course of the day, teach me to accept it with a calm soul and the firm conviction that all is subject to thy holy will. Direct my thoughts and feelings on all my words and actions and all unexpected occurrences. Do not let me forget that all is sent down from thee. Grant that I may deal straightforwardly and wisely with everyone I encounter, neither embarrassing nor saddening anyone. O Lord, grant me the strength to endure the fatigue of the coming day and all the events that take place during it. Direct my will, teach me to pray, to believe, to hope, to be patient, to forgive, and to love. Amen. Uh, I think I first learned this prayer back in the 90s before I was Orthodox. Uh, I was struck by it, uh, but it's got some strong phrases in there, uh, and uh, like the phrase, teach me to accept with a calm soul and the firm, firm conviction that all is subject to thy holy will. As I told you, I was rebelled against that kind of idea when I was young. Uh, much less the other one, uh, in all unexpected occurrences, do not let me forget that all is sent down from thee. And what I can tell you is every time I've written on a topic similar to this on my blog, I get pushback. Lots of pushback. It, it, it brings on motorboats. Uh, but, 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 you know, and uh, uh, the motorboat reaction. And uh, it all is sent down from the, but, but, but what about evil? What about, no, no, no. You know, all is sent down from the, they didn't, it, there's no asterisk, all is sent down from the, and it does beg some questions. 
like what's going on. But one of the things to say about this, um, and as much as I rebelled against some of the notions of this when I was a young man, uh, I have learned first off the doctrine of providence is an old man's doctrine. And that includes old women too. But uh, forgive my uh, incorrect speech. But it's an old man's doctrine. The reason is uh, providence is seen much, much better in the rear view mirror than it is out the windshield. Out the windshield, it's all rushing at you so fast that you, can, you just miss the exit. You know, and you don't know what's going on. And uh, in the rear view mirror, you can see it so much more clearly. So as I look back at my 48 years of married life, I think, wow, that was saving my soul. And I didn't see it. You know, instead, I mean, I, I can remember I got married in my junior year of college. Got married in that ring on my left hand back then. Uh, had that ring and started, got married December 19 uh, of 75. So we were on, on, on Christmas break. And I showed back up on campus in January, and I gotta tell you, that tiny little bit of gold on my left hand was one of the heaviest things I had ever felt in my life. It was like Frodo carrying that ring. For me, it's, I had that thing on my hand, and every time I would see a cute co-ed, this ring would just get so heavy. And I was like, oh, Stephen, you married, boy. You married. Those women, they don't exist for you. You only get one, and you've already got her. No more shopping, no more play in the field, no more flirting, you're done. Oh, it was so heavy. I never told my wife that then. And I didn't come back and say, you know, this ring is so heavy, it's just, no, 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 no. It's like all I can tell is that I gotta go home and settle with the one I got, you know. But so, you, all you can see, looking out that mirror, like that, without realizing the one you got is going to save your life so many times down the road that you'll be grateful that you got her uh, and, and that one. And no, you didn't pick her. God picked her because you didn't know what you were doing. And, uh, and fortunately, neither did she. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway... This, though, is not an isolated prayer. The teaching involved in it is a thoroughly orthodox teaching. It's not borrowed from the West. That is not some influence from, from Calvinism or from Jansenist uh, Catholicism. This is uh, profoundly in the Church Fathers. Uh, probably one of, the, one of the most profound places of it uh, are in the writings of uh, St. Dionysius the Areopagite, who Though likely, I mean, the best uh, authority these days on Dionysius the Areopagite is my bishop, Archbishop uh, Alexander Galitsyn, who taught patristics at Marquette for a lot of years, but he did his dissertation on Dionysus uh, at Oxford under uh, Metropolitan Callisto Square uh, and wrote it he, in, in Greece. He was on Mount Athos the year he wrote his dissertation. Uh, and his spiritual father there uh, was uh, Elder Emilianos, who was the abbot of Simonopatra, who uh, <coughs> Bishop Alexander was going to give up writing his dissertation, just maybe go home and get ordained. And uh, uh, the elder there at the monastery said, no, 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 you need to finish your dissertation, but just stay here and write it. He said, uh, your obedience will be uh, to uh, simply, uh, if you need anything, you have to ask us for it. We won't try to anticipate your needs. What a great obedience to just hang out at Simonopatra for a year and uh, just ask for what you need and the monks can bring it to you and you work and write. But um, Bishop Alexander tells the story that he left Oxford because he was so up to his eyeballs in German uh, scholarship and you know, just dry, analytical, historical stuff that up to his eyeballs, read and say, and Dionysus is thick, hard, fifth century Greek writing, up to his eyeballs in it, and he said he reached the question, what has this got to do with Jesus? Uh, when he told me that story, I loved him because I thought that's a really good question. What has this got to do with Jesus? And you need to ask that of all the fathers because it has a lot to do with Jesus. But uh, Metropolitan Callistos was so wise at the time, he sent him to Greece. You just kind of go work on your Greek and, you know, Thessaloniki and whatever, and, and just take a some time off and come back. So he did. 
and uh, spent more time apparently on Mount Athos than he did at Thessaloniki, but learning his Greek. Um, but he said it was living at Simonopatra with Elder Emilianos as the abbot of this monastery where he saw in living action what Dionysus was writing about in such highfalutin neoplatonic language. Uh, but the reality was being embodied in the life of this holy elder and the liturgical life of the brotherhood at the monastery. Many have said that Simonopatra is just one of the best of all the monasteries on Mount Athos, but he said it was there and it really was a change for him. And uh, he's done it. There's actually a couple of videos out where, uh, and Bishop Alexander is not loquacious to say the least. Um, Eating in my home, he leaned across the table and said to my wife, how do you shut him up? Uh, <laughs> Just such kind words from your bishop. <laughs> My wife was dishonest. She should have said, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, being rude to him works fairly well. So it did that day. But um, he has done, I think, a very, very good job with this. But uh, Dionysus, uh, though he uses the term of the first century convert of St. Paul, that name, he is kind of writing in the name of Dionysus because he's using all these tools of Greek philosophy but putting them in Christian terms. But there is this writing, these writings were done in the fifth century AD, not first century. Uh, uh, one of the most conclusive ways I'll give you evidence of this as an historian is uh, he, uh, Dionysus loves to invent words. He just he take Greeks and invents words. One of the words he invented it never occurs anywhere else in all of Greek literature prior to him is the word hierarchy. Hierarchical, hierarchy. He invents the word hierarchy. He meant by that the holy order of the liturgy, which he said mirrored heaven. The holy order of the liturgy is this order of heaven. Um, what's interesting is that it caught on and after Dionysus the word appears all over the place. So it's kind of like if you're doing, I'm sorry, but if you're doing like detective work and you read through century, 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 and a word never occurs, and then suddenly it's used what's clearly for its first time with given its definition, and after that it's used again and again and again, you may reach a reasonable conclusion that this was when it was written. That's one of the easy proofs that this is, I've had some people, seen some internet stuff for people who don't have any training, don't know what they're doing, but like to produce internet videos, uh, uh, attack uh, Archbishop uh, Alexander uh, for this opinion uh, when he's probably one of the world's greatest scholars on Dionysus and just simply can flat prove to you why it is in a later century and not the first century guide. No one in the first century wrote the way Dionysus uh, reads. So anyway, in case you came here wondering about that, and uh, so I mentioned him, I couldn't resist, but Dionysus, one of the things he writes a lot about is providence. That is, God's good action working in the world and in all things for good. The good action of God working in all things for good. And what's interesting to me as an Orthodox priest is that when Dionysus writes about providence, he interchangeably uses the term Energia, that is energies. When Dionysus writes about the divine energies, he means God's goodwill working, which is in Greek, energia means to work. Energeo is it's energy, it's working. The working of God. Where do you see? You, you come up, feast of St. Gregory Palamas, second Sunday of uh, you know, Lent, and you have you celebrate St. Gregory Palamas, who writes a great deal about energies. And you live in Oak Ridge, and I'm sorry, but you're just suddenly thinking about ooh, glowing in the dark, right? You know, it's like, I want to see the divine light. You know, and I don't know about you, but you know, you're doing the Jesus prayer, and you're waiting for the light bulb to come on literally inside you. Anybody here? I'm not going to shame, shame you, but A, I've never seen the divine light. That would be cool, but I haven't. Uh, B, I've never met anybody yet who did. Doesn't mean they don't, but it's not common. On the other hand, I see the divine energies everywhere 
all the time. Everywhere, all the time, especially as Dionysus writes about it, and to bear in mind that actually Palamos had read Dionysus too, and he has to have it in mind as much as anything else, uh, including the divine light. You know, the difference is Palamos is saying it can also be seen visibly as light. It, but what is this thing? It is the good will of God. The will of God and the energies of God are one and the same thing. God's will, God's energies working in all things for our good. That might sound slightly uh, like it echoes uh, in the 8th chapter of Romans and the 28th verse. St. Paul writes and says, all things work together for good. He adds, for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Now a lot of evangelical preachers will limit that down and say, for us, who love God and are living according to his purposes, all things work together for good. For the rest of them, not so much. Uh, actually, the fathers would teach all things are always working together for good for all. It is it's said in, in the New Testament uh, that uh, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That doesn't mean that everybody will come to repentance, but it is God's will that everybody come to repentance. Uh, God, nobody is lost because God wants it. It is not the will of God that any should be lost. It is not the will of God that any should be lost. So that's a settled matter. And that everything happening around us, to us, through us, in us, is the good working of God for us. And, and we'll see this as we go through here, but this is the doctrine of providence. If earlier in this first talk, I talked about um, knowing that you were created good uh, and having some sense of, of wonder and the awe of God's goodness, providence is just to open your vision and to see that it is everywhere. I mean, we walk through the world in wonder because it is the will of God being poured out in front of us, uh, constantly in front of us. Now, I, uh, and we'll, let me, I'll get down before I go off. So um, I'm going to offer you a, another meditation. This is not a prayer. This is something I wrote in 2015 uh, around the time of Pascha. And so I call it a reverie. Uh, ah, okay, so this is a reverie. And so, like a dream, only I made it up, okay? I was dreaming out loud to myself. It goes like this. It dawns, and everyone is there. And we can't quite remember what we might have had against each other. Now, this is 2015, so I was still an active in charge of a parish. And so it has parish references. I, we couldn't remember quite what it was we had against each other. We're so glad to see faces that we know. Memory fades like the pains in our bones as we stand with joy and see the face of Christ. In the light of His face, only the present has any reality. All things become present in Him, and a sound is heard, first in the distance, but we can't quite figure where in the distance, but it draws nearer. It's a song being sung, it seems strange, though familiar, and then I seem to know the words, and I'm surprised at the sound and the strength of my own voice and how it interacts with every other voice. No two singing the same tune, and yet it's one song. Everyone hears it in their own language. It's the song of the Lamb. And since every moment is present, there is no sense of how long we've been singing or how long we will sing. But in the song, everything comes right. The creation beneath our feet begins to awaken, and the song is taken up by trees and rocks and rivers and sky until all of creation sings, and slowly, the motion of a dance. It's my reverie. That's a private reverie, uh, but if you could put yourself into such a place, into such a waking dream, if your imagination would allow you to go there, then you would be in a place and time that has in fact been promised. It's a vision of the great Pascha to come.
So how do we get there from here? Complete with all of the world, all of its problems, all of the things we call the problem of evil. For that question, I'll turn to a very familiar story. Um, and it's probably one of the most classic stories of this sort. Uh, this is the biblical story of Joseph and his brothers. Uh, one of twelve. And uh, they don't like him because he's kind of obnoxious and has dreams and tells stories that seem to make them seem less than him. They don't like his dreams. And so they decide on the one hand they were going to kill him. And one of the brothers intercedes and says, let's don't kill him. We'll just sell him to the Egyptians when they come by. Now, it's important to understand that it's always wrong to sell your brother. <laughs> Uh, I am absolutely certain my older brother would have sold me if he had the chance. Uh, but he didn't, and I'm, I'm grateful. Uh, but it's always wrong to sell your brother. So as the problem of evil goes, that one's evil. Don't sell your brother. Um, Joseph's story goes from bad to worse, and then from really bad to really worse. Um, he gets sold to the Egyptians. And somehow not everybody gets there, he gets a job. It's a pretty decent job, so things are improving. Joseph is working in the house of Potiphar and as a servant, uh, but then it goes worse. Uh, Potiphar's wife uh, gets an eye for Joseph, and she's propositioning him, and Joseph, being the good man that he is, says no, and it gets worse. And the wife lies about it and tells her husband, Joseph, been making a play for her, and Joseph winds up in prison, so it's getting really worse. And of course, while he's in prison to meet some other guys that things haven't been working very well for, and he's interpreting their dreams. Uh, and that brings him eventually to the attention of the Pharaoh who's having a dream that no one can interpret. Joseph interprets those dreams, and that turns out very good. And Joseph winds up in this story as uh, the second man in charge of Egypt, as the Pharaoh puts him in charge of the of the. Uh, feast and famine plan so that you gather all the fat of the land during the fat years and you store them up and get ready for the seven lean years and Joseph does a great job. Now we all know about payback and we also know that revenge they say is a dish best served cold and so for Joseph his brothers show up and they're starving back in the homeland. And Joseph, of course, doesn't look like anybody they would recognize. He's dressed like some Egyptian authority. And they see him and they don't know. And he's playing some games. They want to bring back little brother Jet Benjamin and all these other little things. And he's doing stuff with them. And, you know, and it all, as we kind of follow this, it works out well. They bring their families. They're moving down. And he's taking care of them. And eventually, uh, instead of doing revenge, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers shows them that I am Joseph. Of course, the brothers are thinking he's going to play the revenge game, and they're scared to death, and they're uh, telling him all kinds of stories. Um, and we have this from Genesis chapter 50. They said, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. We're admitting that, a little repentance. Please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. We're going to play the family game. You know, up a level. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Instead of playing revenge, Joseph weeps. And then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. And the dreams of Joseph as a young boy are being fulfilled right in front of his eyes. And Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? Such humility. I mean, in Egypt, he was in the place of God. They could lift a finger and they're dead. But am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me. It's always wrong to sell your brother. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. You meant it to me for evil. The Lord meant it to me for good. That is, to me, the, the simple biblical phrase that is uh, the best explanation and take on 
uh, God's good providence at work in the world. All kinds of things are happening. And I know that everything happening, my adversary, your adversary, who walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, he means it to me for evil. He means even the good stuff for evil. And he'll take advantage of anything. Liar, a murderer, he's all of those things. But the Lord, because, because he's a good God, See, God, this is, we have to get this settled in our heart above everything else. Is God good? Is God good? I deal with this problem all the time. And any time, as I say, as I touch on the problem of evil, people start, ah, 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 you know, and what about, what about? And we got like, you know, we've got enough wars going on. America loves wars. And all of our history, we've only had 17 years that we were not at war. We love it. We make money from it. And we make lots of money, at least a few people make a lot of money from it. Um, so, I mean, that's just the land we live in. And we're not any different. The Romans did the same thing. We're just an empire. Empires do these things. But God is good. God is good. Uh, and, be, and he does good because he is a good God. Uh, we had it Sunday, uh, or was it? I don't know. You guys read the different order of scriptures than we do in the OCA. The uh, parable of the rich young ruler. Did y'all have that? Or the story of Jesus and the rich young ruler? Yeah. And so he says, uh, why do you call me good? There's none good but God. You know, why is Jesus talking like that? Well, because uh, the good that is God is something we have in communion. Jesus would not define good by his own self, but how he is in relationship to the Father. He is always son of the Father. He's never God of God, but son of the Father. Uh, and so the goodness of Christ is, is and in a sense, he's inviting this young man to discover the goodness that's found in communion. I mean, he goes through all the commandments in which he's being good by himself, like I keep all these commandments, the young man says. But then Jesus offers him the chance to really enter into goodness, in which he says, well then, take what you have, sell it, and give it to the poor. Suddenly, what would happen if he did that? Well, he would be in communion with all these people. There would be people out there loving him, praying for him. Uh, you know, it would be a totally different experience than, you know, being rich, I said earlier, would be a bad thing to be worth a trillion dollars. Because you could think that, you know, I mean, what else do you need? That you have everything you need? And no, you don't. A trillion dollars can't give you what you need. It just gives you lots of stuff and distracts you from what you need. You, you, need, you need God. Only one thing's necessary, and that's God. You need, I need God. And it's very hard for a rich man to think he needs anything. So as Jesus said, it's easier to get a camel through the eye of a needle than a rich man into the kingdom of God. Why? Because he doesn't, he will say in the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, or as one translation says, blessed are those who know their need of God. You know, uh, I've been blessed to work among the rich, uh, very rich. I served a parish for a while in North Carolina with billionaires. Richest family in North Carolina were parishioners of mine. They actually were pretty nice people, frankly. Um, but I've also worked in the poorest of the poor in Appalachia as a hospice chaplain for a couple of years. Uh, on the whole, if I needed a favor, I'd go to the poor people in Appalachia. They'll share anything with you, you know? I mean, I've seen drunks whose only possession was a bottle of wine that they had obtained from begging share it with another drunk. I mean, I, I don't know about you, I know a little bit about drunks, and I know that sharing half of your stash is real generosity, you know? Like C.S. Lewis runs into the beggar on the street, and gives him a pound, and someone said, he's just going to use it to buy a pint. Lewis said, well, that's what I was going to do with it. <laughs> so, what's <laughs> the matter with you? You won't stand a man a pint? Yeah. So, um, but God is at work in us for good in all things. Even the stuff my brothers did to me in selling me to the Egyptians. Even in all of the other things you and I can list. You got a list of resentments? You know, I do. You got a list of resentments? 
Uh, well, if the resentments turn out to be putting you in the second place in Egypt, you know, you're going to have the same resentment or not. I mean, I know people that when they get there, they're ready for the revenge. They're ready for the payback. They're thinking, this is sweet. Boy, my brothers are going to rue the day they sold me as a slave. And, you know, and they don't know nothing. That's the danger. The danger of having too much as you, you start trying to use it the wrong way. Instead, um, we were talking during lunch and someone talked about their visit to Guatemala. You were talking about Guatemala, you know, and how wonderful it was to be with those people and to listen to their prayers in a simple home, dirt floor or whatever. I said, the one thing you probably won't find among the poor in Guatemala are people sitting around discussing the problem of evil. This is not the witness of the church and our missionaries who go into the third world. They come back generally embarrassed by how greedy we are and how happy they are. What's going on? Because we think we're in management. One of the great sins of the secular world is that we think we're in management. Everybody in America thinks they're in management. During the pandemic, everybody thought they were an epidemiologist. I had people telling me how to manage a pandemic as if they knew what they were doing. Everybody critiquing the ones who were managing the pandemic as if they were supposed to know what they, they were doing and they didn't either. Uh, but everybody's a manager. Everybody's an expert on the economy. Everybody's a political theorist. Everybody is you know, a global management expert. We all have these opinions. I had a, a, a guy, several guys from out back of Oak Ridge, deep Appalachia, who would come in to build a, a, a stone stack chimney for me in my house, you know, you know, fixing my fireplace for me. And it was right before the 2020 election. <laughs> And one of the old guys, about 65 years old, they'd asked me something. He found out that I was a preacher. And so uh, he's a preacher. And they started asking me some questions about things. And, and I was being really very bourgeois. And uh, I remember they asked me a question about sexuality things. And I gave them a very bourgeois answer, which is kind of being very pastoral. Like, you know, this might be wrong, but you need to be gentle and kind. And da 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 da. And one of them turned to the other one and he said, He's again it. <laughs> I thought, yeah, that's true. So anyway, I didn't want to freak him out. It was kind of like trying to testify in front of Congress. It, sometimes you just need to say, I'm again it, and, you know, and do that. But this one old fellow said, they asked me how I was going to vote. And again, I was being very hemming and hawing. And this one old fellow says, well, I ain't ever voted. <laughs> I'm sorry, but when you begin a, a discourse on voting by saying, and you're 65, I ain't ever voted. <laughs> but of course, that didn't keep him from having an opinion because <laughs> he's an American. He said, I ain't ever voted, but if I was going to vote, I'd vote for da da da. And I thought, well, good for you. God bless your opinion. Everybody's got one, you know, but yeah, I ain't ever voted. Um, Everybody, we think we're in management, uh, and uh, I've always told people that if you ask uh, a, a, a rich man or even the middle class for a handout, they will give it to you perhaps, but they will want to tell you what to do with it. They want to be sure that you don't abuse it. I was in Jerusalem on a pilgrimage with a, a group of other Orthodox, most of them from England, and we went in to have an audience with the Patriarch of Jerusalem because clergy on, on pilgrimage have to get a blessing from the Patriarch in order to serve in any of the patriarchal churches, including the Holy Sepulchre, which we wanted to do. And so we met with him and we're leaving Jerusalem. This is so biblical. We're leaving Jerusalem through one of the gates. So, lo, he was proceeding through the great gate in Jerusalem and it come out. And of course, outside the gates of Jerusalem are beggars look just like the biblical beggars. Half of them are dressed like Bible characters. One of them comes up to me and begs money from me. And lo and behold, I had a few shekels in my pocket because that's what the Jewish money is in Israel is shekels. So I gave them a few shekels. It seemed like a Bible story to me. I gave them a few shekels and we moved on a few paces more. And one of the sweet little British ladies came up to me and she goes, how do you know they were truly needy? And I said, I don't. I said, but I was just with the patriarch of Jerusalem begging a favor from him and he gave it to me. I said, I think there's a parable that covers this that 
I begged from the rich man and got a favor. And the first time a poor man begs of me and I don't give him a fa I don't give what he asked. So I don't think that works out well in the parable. And she went running back <laughs> and, and gave some shekels to the beggar. <laughs> there you go. The parables still work, even in the gates of Jerusalem. Uh, we are all in management, and we want to manage the outcome of history. This is actually one of the greatest bits of idolatry possible. You and I settle it in your mind. We are not in charge of the outcome of history. Uh, one of the men I studied under at Duke, Stanley Harawas, uh, Time Magazine, for all that matters, uh, once named him America's greatest theologian. Stanley probably agreed with him, but uh, anyway, quite a figure. But I remember him just hammering this into us. You are not in charge of the outcome of history. He said, as soon as you agree to be in charge of the outcome of history, you have agreed to do violence. Because it's the only way you can try to make history come out the way you want it is to do violence. And, you know, uh, so do you believe Jesus is in charge of history? Or do you think you are? I mean, we live by the mantra in our modern world uh, that uh, we need to make the world a better place. And I think, A, you don't know what better is. Who put you in charge of determining what is better? I mean, you don't know what's better. Half the time you do something better and someone on the other side of the world suffers. The law of unintended consequences. Um, I tell people, if, if you want to do good, Here's the simple rule for doing good. Keep the commandments of Christ. He gave us commandments, and not one of them says, make the world a better place. I mean, how could you know a thing like that? You don't know the world. What do you know? Well, my neighbor. Love God, love your neighbor. Do good. Father Stephen, don't you think that... I mean, people will say, well, if I do something that makes his life better, doesn't that make the world a better place? I always respond, let God do the math. You're not in charge of the outcome of history. You don't know, but we know the commandments. What are the commandments? Love your neighbor, love your enemy, give to those who ask of you, share your stuff, um, you know, practice generosity, uh, feed the sick, the poor, the hungry. I mean, in other words, these things are good things, but I know lots of people who think having an opinion about these things and posting on Facebook constitutes making the world a better place. No, it doesn't. You're just ruining my Facebook feed. You know, that's pretty much what you're succeeded in doing. I don't need your opinions. Who cares? You know, basically we share our opinions to prove that we're good people. We, you know, we're like morally preening. You know, look at my morality. That's just do good things. Do good things. I got out of seminary. I was assigned as a deacon in an Episcopal parish in Columbia, South Carolina. I did not get on with the priest I was assigned with. And we got into a bit of a fight in which he told me I had three days to come up with something to do with my time that he would be okay with or else we were going to see the bishop. So I took him seriously and I went to go visit these two Catholic nuns who were somewhat to the left of Mao Zedong. And uh, they were kind of well known in Columbia, South Carolina for their radical activity. I had just met them and I went to them and I told them the story. I said, I need something to do. Do y'all have any suggestions? And uh, one of them went back in her bedroom, came back out and handed me this book about this thick with loose leaf binder with all this material in it. She said, go home, read it tonight and come back for breakfast in the morning and we'll talk. So I get home with this book and I open it up and it's all about food banks which at that time was happening in Arizona, but nowhere else yet. It was just a brand new thing in Arizona. And I looked at it, I thought, this is just really interesting, food banks and stuff. As I went back the next morning, I said, yeah, this is cool. What do you have in mind? They said, let's start one. And I, you know, so anyway, the long story short is I wound up as the president and founder of Harvest Hope Food Bank in Columbia, South Carolina, because these two Catholic nuns, they said to me, look, everybody in Columbia knows us, and when they see us, they run the other way. We're always into something. We need a white man with a collar as a front guy. <laughs> and they said, nobody is whiter or more upfront than an ordained Episcopalian. And so... 
They taught me how to beg, how to do the front job. I testified in front of the legislature in the state, got a good Samaritan law passed to indemnify donors. We got this food bank, and I think they moved 20 some odd million tons of, uh, of, I mean, it's ridiculous amounts of food every year. It's the central food bank in, in central South Carolina, uh, which I did to get out of trouble uh, with my rector. Uh, and, but it was, you know, feed the poor, you get an opportunity. There's so many real opportunities for things like that, whether it's volunteering at a local uh, food bank or, you know, other sorts of things that are just there. It's everywhere. You know, there's opportunities to do good and to keep the commandments of Christ, which is so much better than having an opinion about world hunger. You know, I mean, a lot of things about world hunger are exactly what they are because of the powers that be who that you and I can't do much about other than vote. And if voting made any difference, they wouldn't let us do it. Uh, I'm sorry, but that's kind of so. You know, high papa lorum, low, low papa hiram, I think it was that uh, Huey Long talked about back in the 1930s, or Tweedledum, Tweedledee. You vote and it's about the same thing both ways. You know, do good. Do good where it comes to you in your life. You've got a family, do good to your family, forgive them, you know, live, uh, you know, you, you, we have this global mentality because we watch news and other things that are selling emotions and passions to us. I mean, this is what the internet and the news stuff does, it sells passions. Um, the best way for me to get you to take action is to make you angry. Uh, that emotion will move you. So politics makes you angry so that you will act. That doesn't mean so you will think. It doesn't want you to think. Uh, it doesn't want you to think, you know, I disagree with my brother. And it wants you to think, my brother is the biggest jerk in the world and I hate him. That's what it wants. And it does it to us all the time. And why does it, why, why does it want your vote? Because it's just providing cover. They're going to do what they do. They're all bought and paid for. I'm just telling you the truth. I'm not saying this is at any political thing at all. I'm just telling you, why don't we all know this? It's obvious to us. We actually all know it, but we don't say it because my baby daughter in her 30s says, Papa, you're so cynical. And I say, I'm not cynical. I'm old. I'm old. I've got an older brother who was going off about one of our recent wars and was all, I might have been whatever, Ukraine. He was all, the wars. I said, dude, you were in Vietnam. They lied to you. Almost 60,000 of us died in that war and they lied and they knew they were lying. They didn't care. They don't care now. There are rights and there are wrongs. But trust me, the ones who are in charge of telling the story, they don't care. Doesn't mean that nobody who writes on it cares. I'm just telling you, the ones in charge don't care. They didn't, they haven't, repeatedly. I'm sorry if that doesn't, if that sounds unspiritual. I've started saying things like this because I've spent so much time both writing and as a priest in a parish, listening to people who were so angry. They come to confession and they're angry and everything around them is feeding the anger. During the last election cycle, it was just tangible, the anger. And I'm thinking, somebody needs to tell them to chill. You're not in charge of the outcome of history. You need to learn to live like a Christian instead of a hyphen Christian, that is some kind of political Christian. Quit that, quit being the pawns. You have a king and he's not up for election. He doesn't have to be. And you've been elected, you know, to be his children. Live faithful to that. Keep the commandments of Christ a day at a time, one thing at a time. If God calls you and puts you into some sort of position of power, then practice the teachings of Christ and live responsibly. But he's not telling you, you know, you've got to change the world. You won't. Been there, drank the Kool-Aid, you know, got the t-shirt, got the bumper sticker. I'm a child of the 60s. And now those idiots of the 60s are in charge. They don't care. They use the same slogans. They don't care. That's how they got there. That's how they got there. So it's just, 
This is important when we start drilling down with providence. The vision of secularism is that we are in charge, that there's this, the things don't have any meaning. I mean, you, you read about something and it'll talk about a war, a bombing, and say 20 children were killed in the bombing. They call that collateral damage. You and I should call that 20 irreplaceable human lives that should have been valued as human beings. But in our global measurements, we measure things like by statistics. Their statistics, your baby, your baby, your child. And this is how we live. Children, uh, uh, or uh, uh, Christians of the early centuries were gathering babies by the river where the Romans had put them out. It was sort of their form of abortion. Babies died, don't want it, put it down by the river. River God will take care of it. Yeah, uh, like that. We invented orphanages. This is well known um, uh, among what the early Christians said. We invented orphanages and we took care of these children and we raised them uh, because we treated each one as the image of God. You know, did it change the world? Did it alter Roman law? No. Did that eventually change? Somewhat. Uh, but in the meantime, Christians were picking up babies. It's kind of how it was. I set a rule for myself uh, when I was first ordained as a priest, and that was because I was pro-life. I, therefore, I had a blanket offer. If you're in my congregation, or you come to me, and you're pregnant, and you need help because you know, it's pushing you towards an abortion, then whatever it takes, I will help, down to my last penny. Why? Because it's worth it. And it doesn't matter at all if I preach about it, and I don't do that. I've raised money. Uh, I've paid for babies. I had one grandmother chewing me out because I talked her daughter out of an abortion in one parish, an Episcopal parish I served in. And, you know, but she came to me and she said, help me. My mother's trying to force an abortion on me. I said, I promise you, I will take care of you and the baby. And what's interesting is she had the baby and that grandmother came to love that baby above all else and fulfilled life and, and apologized and was sorry about all of that. But somebody needed to be willing to just take care of the baby the way Christians do. Why? Because it's a commandment. It's as simple as that. It's not any harder than that. You don't have to solve the whole problem. You just have to take care of the one that comes your way. You do that one by one, day by day. All things are sent down from God. It's our job not to solve the world, not to fit, you won't fix the world. In fact, what is the trajectory of history according to the scriptures? Where's it going? From the lips of Jesus to the lips of the apostles, it is a single line upheld in the fathers. It's going down. I mean, according to the scriptures, things get worse and worse until they get so bad, Jesus said that even the elect would not be saved unless the days were shortened. If he didn't come back quickly, they wouldn't be able to hang in there. That's the witness of the scriptures. That's where history is headed. Uh, and sometimes you feel like you live in a time that at least rhymes with that. You're like, how long can we keep doing this? Well, you know, longer than you think. Um, but that's where it's headed. We've been told that from the beginning. I run into Christians today who have these false notions. Mostly they're born out of bad 19th century Protestant theology, uh, the, the uh, social gospel movement that, see, that use false language like that we're building the kingdom of God. You cannot build the kingdom of God. It's already come in Jesus Christ. You cannot build it. What are the blocks you use? You, you can't do that. You, you have no sense that anything you do will last beyond tomorrow. We don't know these things. We can't know these things. We can live in accordance and obedience to the kingdom of God, but we don't build it. We're not building history. And of course, the, the narrative of the modern world is things are getting better and better. We're making progress. That's great if you're measuring a rich man's bank account. You know, that's what's getting bigger and better. It's not, you know, I've got not the latest iPhone, but about next to the latest iPhone. That's cool, but it's nothing. It, the kingdom of God's no closer in my phone uh, than it was before, and they don't have a kingdom of God model designed yet. But people think it's probably getting a little bit better. I'm just telling you, it's, 
the, the progress is getting weird, right? The technology, which is very strange. Um, and instead, here you have Guatemalan poor and dirt floors, happier than any of us. Why? Because they're living day to day next to it all and keeping the commandments a little at a time. And, you know, um, I was speaking at Holy Cross Seminary a few years ago and they raised the questions among the Greek Orthodox there. What about our children? They go to college uh, and they leave the church. What do we do? And I said to them, well, you came to America and you bought the American dream. And now your children act like rich Protestants. They go to college and they leave God. Your grandmother scratching the dirt back in Greece kept the faith in the face of the Turks. These people can't even keep the faith in the face of Netflix. You didn't, you know, this, you didn't want them to suffer. Who told you to do that? That'll make a bad person. You know, God allows some suffering in our lives because we need it. Uh, and he alone, I wouldn't dare do that to my children. My, and my son, who is now in his mid-30s, um, when he was about, oh, seven or eight years old, we get a thing back from their doctor or something like that, the schools, that told us that he had ADHD. And I remember at the time thinking, oh dear. And I felt so bad for him. And I, I did. I just sort of like, oh dear, there's something wrong with my child. And I thought, well, his life will be difficult. And I was sort of sitting there and looking at him and quietly pitying him. You know, and maybe myself a little bit. And uh, it was one of these moments that God spoke to me. I mean, like very clearly in my heart, God spoke and said, this is for his salvation. And you talk about being brought up short. I mean, you want your child to be, you know, to have all the advantages of everything you've learned. And you, you know, I was going to raise my son to know everything that I wished I had known when I was that age and stuff. And, you know, one of the things I didn't know when I was his age is that I had ADHD. They hadn't invented that term back then. When I was finally diagnosed as an adult at age 58, my children laughed and said, you don't know you have that? Everybody knows you're ADD, Dad. I mean, it's kind of like everybody knows. My son, my son who has, it, it formed and shaped him as a person. He's actually a senior software engineer, which admittedly kind of, you have to have meds to do that when you're ADHD, but he does. And he gets his job done and he's happy and he's well, but he's also a very good man. He's a good man. He, he attends the church. He has a good family. He has boys that he raises. They pray every day. He's all of those things. And I can promise you, he wouldn't have been all of those things had it not been for the things that he suffered. There were other things as well, but the things he suffered also made him a good man. And I was there to watch and occasionally to encourage and probably sometimes as a stumbling block. But he became a good man. I wouldn't dare say, you know, God, here's my son. Can you give him a mental condition uh, in order to really bless his life? I mean, what kind of parent in their right mind would ever pray a prayer like that? Well, you don't pray a prayer like that. But if you're a sane parent, you also say, thank you, God, including for the mental condition that my son has. Work it for his good because you are good. Because you are good, and I will give you thanks for all things, including my son, who, it's interesting, at, um, he learned this from one of his grandfathers. My wife's dad was very insistent that all things work together for good and was radical about it. My son had a child die at three days of age, born too early in the hospital. And I remember being in the hospital with my son as he held this baby in his arms and screamed to watch your own child in just the depths of bereavement and just how it broke his soul. Um, and, you know, and he finally, you know, we had to let it go. And uh, three days later, we did a burial. And, every, and I had baptized this child just before she died. And three days later, we did a burial. Churches all gathered around. And my son had um, picked out a headstone and it, we didn't, wasn't ready yet, but on the headstone, it had her little name and, and carved in it, glory to God for all things. 
And I thought, he learned that from his grandfather. I titled a blog that, but he learned it from his grandfather and heard me extol it for years that it was the right way to be. And it's a test. You just buried your first child, and you're saying glory to God for all things. Now, he's got two boys that have since been born, and thank God for the intercessions of Matushka Olga of Alaska, uh, whose intercessions we sought and did, that those trials, they went through very difficult pregnancies, but those two boys were born. But I, you know, I mean, to me, to have raised a son who at such a moment of suffering can say glory to God for all things. My wife and I lost our fifth child, James was six years old. I picked him up at school and I told him about this child that had died uh, about six months along in pregnancy. And uh, you can see this is already working in his life. He's driving along. First question was, was it anybody's fault? That's a six-year-old, want to know who's in, whose fault it is. Said, no son, it wasn't. He just died. We don't know why, but it was nobody's fault. He's very quiet again. He said, then he's with Jesus in heaven. I said, yes, son, he's with Jesus in heaven. He's quiet again. And he said, then it's okay, isn't it? And I said, yes, son, it's okay. End of discussion. That was six years old. At the age of 10, we were received into the Orthodox Church. His brother, whom we had buried, was named Michael Seraphim. My son is James Stephen, goes by James. And... Uh, the night before his chrismation, my son came to me. He said, Papa, he's my junior. He said, Papa, I will always be your junior. He said, but when I'm chrismated tomorrow, can I carry one of my brother's names? I want to be chrismated James Seraphim. You know, and so he was. And, and he's James Seraphim to this day, tonsured reader in the church, James Seraphim. Um, you know, already blessing God when he was six years old because he was good and learning that. This is, you know, this is providence at work in my life and yours. And this is not providence that, oh, it'll all be fine. This is like, you know, are other silly things you can say to people. I mean, if somebody's suffering, you don't just say to them, you know what, this will just be fine. You know, if somebody's suffering, you don't say to them, well, God doesn't give us more than we can bear. I've watched him smash people. Okay, been there, uh, been there myself. Uh, I've done some, done, been smashed before. Um, God is a good God, and He loves us. He's also promised us a cross. He did not spare His only Son, but gave Him up for us all. If He didn't spare His only Son, He ain't going to spare mine either. It just, but I need to become the kind of man who can walk with my Son, be with my Son, and help him to become the man who can confess that God is good and in so doing become a good man. This is this doctrine of providence. I'm convinced that though we don't preach it very much, there's an awful lot of ways to say this wrong and an awful lot of ways to just upset people with it so we tend not to go there, but the fathers go there all the time. Uh, our scriptures go there all the time. We need to understand that God alone is good and that he works all things together for our good, but all the things he is working together, the, you have to understand what is the goodness of God. The goodness of God is defined by the cross. The goodness of God is revealed in Jesus Christ crucified. Frankly, if God was talking about some kind of good where he didn't have any skin in the game, I don't know that I'd be willing to listen to him. I mean, kind of exempt in looking at our world, and the stuff we go through and say, well, you know, I'm just good. And then tell me about it. Are you good? Are you good? Yes. The goodness of God is revealed to us in the crucified Christ. And we're told not only that, but we're also told uh, mystically the Lamb was slain before the foundation of the earth. This, this isn't just an accident along the line of history. Jesus couldn't help it, and he only did this as a rescue mission. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ reveals who God is. God is love, and crucifixion is what it looks like. God went to the cross for the joy set before him. Jesus died on the cross because God loves us. And I, the goodness I see in the world, frankly, is cross, 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 cross. I see the world crucified all the time. But it's in Christ crucified, dead, 
and risen. It's why we sing with such gusto at Pascha. Christ has risen from the dead, trampling down death by death. And, you know, it's my death, it's your death, it's the death of everybody around us. Christ on the cross is trampling down death and raising us up. And yes, we do look for a final victory over it all. We will come back to that reverie that I mentioned, that it's, it's all done, it's okay. I mean, and, and at Pascha, you listen to the sermon of St. John Chrysostom, and he's just describing it this day. If, if you, you heedless, these translations we use from the Greek are so weak. I'm so sorry. St. John Chrysostom is saying, you drunks, would you guys come and receive Pascha? He says, you sober and you heedless, what does heedless mean? What's the opposite of sober? That's who he's talking to when he says that. You sober and you not so sober. Come and eat. The, the feast is prepared for you and on and on. The feast, the feast, the feast. This is that feast and at Pascha. This is God's great Pascha that he makes known to us in Jesus Christ. And Pascha is God's providence. And so the problem with us is that our Pascha is not big enough. We get it reduced to one day a year, and it's just all the time. Everything is Pascha. Everything is Pascha. Pascha reveals God to us. St. Paul will say to the Corinthians, I've determined to know and preach only one thing among you, and that is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So Paul, I mean, Paul had, he's constantly being beaten, shipwrecked. All of this sort of stuff, falsely accused, whipped with a cat three times with the cat of nine tails, the 40, getting the, you know, the 39 lashes, and Paul's just confessing that all things work together for good. You know, even, even Paul's sinful participation in the stoning of St. Stephen, God used it for good. It was part of the conversion of St. Paul. God was preparing his greatest missionary, and he used even the evil St. Paul did for his good. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 20-something or other in there, that God, meaning the Father, God made him, Christ, God made him to be sin. It doesn't mean he made him to be a sinner. God made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. This is one of the most profound verses in Scripture. He made Him to be sin. Even in your sin, though in your sin you feel cut off from God, Jesus, He's not waiting for you to get right to come to Him. Jesus became sin that you might have communion with Him even in your sin because He came to you. Because in your sin, He came to you. He made him to be sin who knew no sin, that you might become the righteousness of Christ. That's what that icon of the resurrection, we've got one around here. Jesus in the resurrection, orthodox icon, he's in hell. He's come to get us. You know? Yep. We're... Which one? Somewhere. No, no, that's, that's, the, trans that, that's the ascension. Father. Yeah. Oh, yonder. All right. Yes. There he is at the epitaphion. Descended into hell, the gates of hell beneath, grabbing Adam and Eve. I try to explain this is the difference between us and Protestants sometimes, is they think these are like, oh, these are the worst sinners. If Eve hadn't done that like that. In the Orthodox Church, Adam and Eve are saints. They are saints. They get feasts. And the forefathers' feasts, we honor them as saints. We name people for them. We could have a Saint Adam Orthodox Church. St. Adam and Eve, wouldn't that freak them out? St. Adam and Eve, Orthodox Church, they're saints to us. God worked good despite their fall. He worked all of that. They were faithful, you know, after the garden. They worshipped Him. They had a couple of problems with the boys. Uh, what parent doesn't? You know, but even that, God works all of these things for good. This is who we are. This is what we are. This is what's going on. A number of the fathers say there is no way no way possible to know peace in your life if you're not settled uh, that God is good and is working for good. The anxiety will drive you crazy. And it doesn't mean that we stop caring or that we stop having any concern. But when I trust that God is good, my wife is actually really good at this because she was raised with this holy man of a father, this Baptist deacon that believed this stuff. I mean, he believed it crazy he believed it. It's like radically he believed it. And so she still does. It drives me crazy sometimes because 
I like to be anxious. I was born that way. And um, heck, I've even been treated for an anxiety disorder. So it's like I've, I've been professionally anxious. And, uh, you know, and so it's, we're doing something and I'm just sort of mouthing off our anxiety. And she's just absolutely calm and certain it's all going to be okay. And I think, I know you're right. <laughs> I know you're right. Pray for me. Pray for me. I'm still working on it. 48 years of marriage and I'm still working on it. It's going to be okay. Why? Because Christ is risen from the dead. He trampled every anxiety down beneath his feet and he has done all things well. And so we trust in him. You know, this is, we live in really crazy times. The key to being orthodox in America isn't that we're going to fix America. Guess what? We're a minority. We're going to be a minority. There is really almost no vision that includes us being anything but a minority. But the last time I checked, it's all he needs. In fact, God really likes minorities. I mean, read the story of Gideon. I mean, he whittles them down from 10,000 to 300. Why? He just likes the odds. <laughs> you know, if I'm going to fight 10,000 Midianites, uh, about 300 Jews, that'll do. Uh, you know, this is just this is the kind of God we serve. You're going to pick somebody? How about, ooh, number eight, David. Yeah, yeah. Everybody else thinks Goliath is too big to hit. David thinks he's too big to miss. I mean, you know, this is, this is how God is with us. This is how he will be in my life and yours. This good God who loves mankind. Every service we have finishes with those words. For he is a good God who loves mankind. Philanthropos, we say in the Greek. He's a good God who loves mankind. And, you know, what do we need in this land? Just some people who will bear witness to that truth, you know. Did the, do you think the 12 apostles meeting together in that upper room sat around and discussed plans to convert the Roman Empire? I mean, I think most of their plans were how we can get out of here and not get noticed, uh, right? And, and to get past all of that. They had no idea what God was up to. When we were being persecuted so terribly under the Emperor Decian in the 200s, you know, nobody's sitting around thinking, well, you know, just a few decades, we're going to be the official uh, religion of the Roman Empire. And if somebody had thought that when Constantine made us, the, or whatever, and made us legal, that that was good news, well, it's kind of good news, but there's actually many, many worse temptations about being the official religion of the Roman Empire than there is being persecuted. Yeah? It's easier to be faithful as a persecuted Christian than it is to be, you know, able to suck up to the emperor. Yeah, it's just, you know, I, these young Orthodox will get all excited and talk about Holy Mother Russia or Byzantine Empire, and I'm thinking, you don't know some of the worst times the church has ever endured were in these so-called holy places. Czars persecuted us. Peter the Great was shutting down monasteries. They got rid of the patriarch, reduced us to a metropolitan. It, on and on it goes. It was difficult. God help us, the Bolsheviks gave us the patriarchate back in Russia. You know, and I don't know if that did us any good or not. But, you know, these are just things. God is doing good and has settled that in our hearts. His providence is good doing all things. So, I'm done. Uh, I think I've done about enough providence there. I could beat this horse for a few more minutes, but I think he's dead. Uh, and so I'll, we can have a little bit of Q&A, and Father can cut us off at some sort of reasonable time. Thank you for being here and coming out. Look, we preach the sunshine in. Yes. Yeah, there's the 60s for you. <laughs> You're a my, flashback. Yeah, my hair's too short, though. No. <laughs> It wasn't back then, so... Questions? Uh, yeah. Break down the term modernity. Yes, I'll give you a couple of quick sentences of definition. What is modernity? I certainly harp on it on my blog. It's just a collective term for a set of ideas. Modernity is not about technology. We've never had a time in human existence that we weren't doing technology, even if it was a new, improved flint, you know, to go on your era. We've always done technology. Um, that's not it. Uh, modernity is a set of ideas, largely uh, the notion of progress, that we're in charge of history and we're making it go somewhere, though nobody seems to know where it is. 
uh, but we're making excellent time. Um, a notion of, of secularism, that it's us who are having to work these things out. The notion of the individual and individual freedom is the key to human identity. That my mama used to tell me when I was a boy, you can be anything you want to be. Mama was wrong. You can't be anything you want to be. I mean, when I was 45 or so, it dawned on me that I was never going to be rich. <laughs> Wasn't going to happen, thank God. Uh, but Mama told me I could be anything I wanted to be. Actually, one of the things I discovered is I cannot be a really great, talented pianist. I wanted to do that. It's not going to be, it's not in my fingers. I do like to play, but it ain't, I, uh, I mean, on and on and on. These things are, are typical of modernity. Modernity has a lot of myths. Uh, one of the myths of modernity is the myth of democracy. Uh, and uh, I know a lot of Christians who would come to confession and say that they didn't vote and, and thought it was a sin because they've been told it's their duty. You may vote if you wish to. There is no Christian duty to vote. There just isn't one. We have no such commandment. Sorry. And if you've preached otherwise, shame on you. So, uh, no, no, we don't. Um, and... Uh, I like to follow what Jerry Garcia said, speaking of the 60s and prophets and stuff. He said uh, last time he checked, the lesser of two evils was still evil. <laughs> and I've got to deal with God. I don't vote for evil. I just don't. Someone wrote on my blog recently and said politics is necessary. And I thought, no, it's not. No, it's not necessary. I mean, it's necessary if you think you're in charge of history and you want to make things come out, but so I say, it's not having the effects you think it is. It's, you know, participate in it. But I like to tell people, like my father-in-law, who is this wonderful man, he did take his citizenship very seriously. He attended every single meeting of the city council in his town. Never ran for office. He lived in Aiken, South Carolina. He went to every single uh, city. They, they knew him. He participated. He was a Republican. He went to the Republican precinct meetings and participated. If you say you care about politics and you've never ever been to a precinct meeting, sorry, your opinion is just nothing. You, you don't even know what, how politics works. You think it's about voting. When the voting happens, the politics have already taken place. Who picked the candidate? And you weren't there when they picked. So. Uh, in other words, it's just, but it, it, if you care, you want to do something, there's ways to do that. But don't pretend that having an opinion is about that. Um, modernity, um, as I said, it's a very interesting set of myths. The thing that powered modernity more than anything else was not, some people talk about the Enlightenment and the French and all like that. It was actually the Scottish Enlightenment that powered uh, that because the Scottish discovered something the French never did and that was that these inventions can be used to make money and it was the marriage of technology with making money that which is what powers technology now why do we have technology because someone wants to make more money that's why we have technology the doctors who invented uh, the treatment for diabetes, you know, invented insulin. They didn't patent it so that it would be free. Do you know how much insulin costs per month now? Hundreds of dollars. I've got a daughter who works in an endocrinology lab in uh, uh, Memphis, Tennessee, who spends half her day on the phone trying to get insurance companies to pay for something that was invented to be free. No, no, no. It's, it's new and improved. It's new and improved so that, you know, Every time a medication, the patent expires so that it could be cheap, somebody tweaks it, repatents it, and it doesn't get cheap. Why? This is part of our modernity. Uh, it's powered and it makes profits, and this is how it goes. So it's, this is, you know, I'm not new in saying this. G.K. Chesterton wrote about it. Hilaire Belloc wrote about it. Uh, Tolkien, if you get into his letters, Lewis, all of them, in other words, this is nothing new. Uh, it's as, in fact, there's a kind of a 19th century tradition of critiquing modernity. I just hadn't heard anybody do it until I was studying under Hauerwas at Duke uh, in my nice sweet Anglican seminary where they were all participating in the prophets. Nobody bothered to critique modernity. We were riding the crest of, of modernity. You know, suddenly I get what Howard was and it's like, whoa, wait a minute. And I'd argue with him and I'd go back and read and I'd think, 
dang, he's right. You know, and especially when it came to digging into the gospel and what did Jesus actually say? And how is this deluding me? And a generation, and on and on. How do I live as a Christian? I mean, if you were living in the Roman Empire, it would behoove you to know something about the Roman Empire. You happen to live in the modern empire. And so it behooves us to actually pay attention to the culture we live in. It's as simple as that. And living in America, you are in the belly of the beast. We own modernity. We own modernity. If you go to Paris, they're wearing blue jeans. If you go to Guatemala, they're wearing blue jeans. We export it all around the world, all around the world. Um, so it's, that's kind of modernity. It's a set of ideas. And the thing is, is that they're culture ideas so that you don't even have to think about them. You just, everybody thinks they're true because everybody thinks they're true. Uh, and if you question them, I can tell you, you will get pushback. But, but, the motorboats will come out. But, 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 I'm just telling you, you know. Uh, so, anyway. Now, somebody told me the other day that I had a pet peeve about this. And I thought, yes, I do. Okay. <laughs> and the reason is, is because I'm right. <laughs> But, you know, show me a southerner who ever thought he was wrong. <laughs> I was raised to be right. So, I've been wrong about a few things. So, well, okay, a lot of things. Uh, another question. That got a long answer. Anybody else brave? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I love what you said in your first talk about uh, approaching the world with wonder, interacting with it. Uh, you mentioned the trees, and uh, you know, I, I can understand that because trees are alive. But yes. I'd like for you to elaborate more on like inanimate objects, and I'm thinking about my messy house, for example. <laughs> Well, you know, some messy houses have things that are alive in them, too. <laughs> if the mess gets serious enough, then you have a problem. But uh, if you turn on the lights and the mess scurries, you've got a problem. Uh, I've lived in that apartment. You know, uh, the scriptures talk about, the, Jesus said, if you make the children be quiet, the rocks themselves will begin to sing. Uh, the scriptures are not really very keen on the notions of animate and inanimate. Uh, had a guy this last week, I was up in Dayton, uh, proudly told me that he was a vegan. Okay? And not only was he a vegan, but he'd begun to think that everybody should be a vegan, uh, that this is like being in the garden, we're not killing animals. And I later, I thought a lot about that. I said several things to him to help him. <laughs> um, but one of those, it, it, I thought, you know, he doesn't have a lot of regard for vegetables. Uh, they're, they're alive. Uh, and in fact, according to some early philosophers, including some of the early church fathers, they would say vegetables have souls. Not a soul like us, but a vegetable soul. It's a little different as souls go. But I mean, they're alive and you're eating them. So whatever it is. But, you know, same thing I feel about uh, animals. You should eat them respectfully, you know. Uh, don't exploit them. Uh, and, you know, but eat them respectfully on the right days. <laughs> you know, we, uh, but yet our monks don't eat them, and that's okay for them. And if you want to live like a monk, fine. I told this fellow, if you want to do that, that's just fine. But do not think that you've chosen a morally superior route. You, you haven't. It, we're, our lives are dependent upon communion, including the communion with the living things. Now, as the so-called, we say inanimate objects, uh, animus is the Greek, I mean, the Latin word for soul. So an inanimate object would mean a, an, uh, an object without a soul. Okay, rocks. Uh, I can't say that about trees. They've got those vegetable souls. They're not inanimate. Um, but even the rocks will sing. There's a in the teaching of the fathers, all created things have a logos, a little, a little logos, little lambda logos. And every logos is a reflection of the logos. Included in the logos, Christ our God, second person of the Trinity, is every logos of created beings. So even the rocks have a logos. Have you read any stories about uh, St. Paisius? No, Porphyrius. Porphyrius, he's the one. St. Porphyrius, I mean, Porphyrius to tell you where to dig a well. Uh, other kinds of things like that. Porphyrius, 
uh, in creation were just like this. He just, he knew creation. He could see things. He knew the logoi of all created things. And he's, he's just, you know, it's just incredible how he did things. Um, I read some stories recently, just blew my socks off about, but anyway, um, if we knew what we should know, I mean, or what we were created to know, uh, I mean, like, if you will, how did Adam know a rock? You know, it's like God brings the animals to Adam to name. It's like, how, did, what, how does Adam know an animal? He doesn't know them like fluffy. I mean, he knows a giraffe like a giraffe. He knows the nature of a giraffe. He knows the logos of a giraffe. As an unfallen man, is clear to him. He can see these things. By the grace and power of the Holy Spirit, sometimes it's given to us to see things like this. But the fathers, Dionysus particularly is one that I would point to, talk about what they call natural contemplation. That is the uh, it, uh, uh, theoria physici. That is the the, uh, the physical order, uh, contemplating it and thinking about it. And part of that isn't just thinking about rock as rock, but what is the logos of a rock? Uh, paying attention to that, having respect for it. Uh, my wife and I both took a geology course in college, and we still like it. I, like I said, I encountered this rock on a trail, and I was curious about it. I knew that it was limestone, which meant it used to be uh, it was, it used to be a, a seabed. It was sand and hardened under this seabed millions of years ago. And so I was paying attention to that. I wondered what critter made these lines, or is that a, a critter line or a later line, you know? But I, having respect for the rock, you know, it's okay. It's a lot of story there. I don't know all of those stories. Uh, what does it sound like when you hear the rock sing? I wrote an article, I posted one just this last week on the song of all creation. When you're in the church and you're doing Byzantine chant and there's the ison, and there's the, the camel call on top, you know, and, uh, but you've got the ison, this, the, the, you know, the one note beneath it all. I like to think that the ison is the sound of creation. It's the sound, it's the sound of God in creation, kind of like creation just humming. Mm, and we're decorating it with, you know, something or other, but mm, creation's just humming. And I, I really do believe that if, uh, that spiritually as you grow, uh, that it's possible to hear the song of creation. I love it. The, uh, I was reading something recently about Captain Cook, the British explorer who lands first in Australia and New Zealand. He got to Australia and they're talking with the Aborigines in Australia, the Aborigines were absolutely shocked when they found out that the Englishmen could not hear the stars. They thought there's something really wrong with these people. They can't hear the stars. And I'm thinking, okay, this is really cool. I want to know more about star listening. I, I like that. I like that a lot. Um, I, I oftentimes think that there were folks walking around here before we showed up, my ancestors. We've been here ever since we stole the place. And, uh, but, oh yeah, they, uh, they may have had stories too, and not just about the stars, but about the rocks and about other things. I know, for instance, um, I met a priest, Father John Muther, in England. Well, I was over there doing a conference once, and Father John, uh, had traveled and visited all these old Orthodox holy places across northern England and Scotland. And he did a book full of pictures. He gave me the book, but it's with the stories. And a lot of places you have to go and go digging through uh, a cornfield or something or just something covered over with weeds to go find St. So-and-so's well or spring that used to be there, these holy places that if you're in Romania, there's a monastery there, you know, and all of that. But in England, it's been suppressed for so long, you had to go dig through a thousand years of history to go find these things. They're easier to find in Ireland because the Catholics remembered them. Protestants tried to cover them up, but the, here they are. Um, it was wonderful looking at this. And all I can say is, my ancestors knew about this stuff. They had thin places. They knew there were places in, you know, Scotland, England, Ireland, wherever, that it was a good place to build a church. They oftentimes built a church where the pagans had been worshiping there. Why? Because there's something about this place. There's something about this place. What is it about this place? Well, I don't know. Something about this place. Jacob, laying with his head on a rock, has a dream one night, and he sees a ladder go up to heaven. 
and angels ascending and descending on the place. Jacob, if he had been a modern, would have woke up and said, whoa, what did I eat last night? Oh man, mushrooms, I don't know. Just like Jacob woke up from the dream and said, what is this place? This place is none other than the house of God, Bethel, Bethel. This house, this is Bethel, and what did he do? He built an altar and made a sacrifice to God. This is the place. That's, that, if you will, is a pre-modern and even a Christian revelation. This place, the cause of the dream was this place, not my head. Moderns think everything's in our head. Silly, silly people. Uh, it, we built a church. You know, people say, do we need churches to worship God? No. Do you need a spigot to get a drink of water? No, but it's a lot more convenient. You know, this is a spigot. This holy place is a Holy Ghost spigot. You can come in here and just get a good drink of the Holy Ghost, or at least on a spoon. You know, you come here for that. Is he everywhere present and filling all things? Yes, but he has an appointment to meet you here. And so you come here that you can meet him in this thin place. It gets really thin in there, you know, and out here. Uh, and every human being is a thin place. Some of us thinner than others, but every human being is a thin place. God meets us there. You can encounter Christ in another human being. Were we about there, Father? I don't know. I'm just, I'm just running on whatever. It's really awful. I know. I appreciate you all's patience. Yes. Uh, Father, uh, uh, I think many of us here are converts. Yep. So am I. And I think that it's because we that this is the truth that God gave us and that we're unfettered. Yep. I, I think it's true. I think that as converts, we were hungry for this. Um, sometimes we surprise our cradle Orthodox brothers and sisters because they forgot what this was. And that's easy to do. You, you take for granted what you've always had, you know, and so we're, we're here for each other. I wrote in my second book uh, over there on shame, uh, I wrote a chapter on the shame of conversion. One of the things I noted in it is that uh, the Orthodox in America are, have only recently gotten to America. It wasn't till their churches were flooded with converts that they actually had to discover what a Protestant thinks. It's very, you know, they didn't have to do that. You know, I've met Greek priests who have no idea what Protestants think. They've lived in an Orthodox world. They don't know. They don't want to know. It's like, why do I need to know that? Well, because you live in America and we breathe Protestantism here. And you need to know that. Even the Catholics breathe Protestantism here. They've been here a long time. And they breathe more Protestant than Catholic nowadays. Uh, but uh, they are encountering us. I think this is, you talk about providence. Uh, the churches, we have anecdotal accounts all across the country. We have churches being flooded with young men, young women, fa young families coming in in numbers we've never seen before just in the last year, two years. I'm absolutely convinced that it has something to do with the pandemic. I've got theories about that, but it's not a coincidence. So as bad as that was, and as much as we all complained about it, God meant it to us for good. The devil and everybody else might have meant it to us for evil. God meant it to us for good. And so like some of our, I've seen Romanian people like Father Roman Braga, who was imprisoned uh, under Ceausescu and saying, thank God, I thank God for my prison. Those guys aren't crazy. You knew Father George Calcio. I knew he would have said the same. These guys, they knew it. They were walking, walking billboards of providence and lived it and walked it and shared it. And if I, I, I was kind of rescued from losing my faith back in the 70s. I'd left a charismatic house church. I was a little weirded out because we'd just gotten too weird and over the edge. And I wasn't certain if anything was real. And uh, while I was in college, uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn is kind of foisted onto the world, wins the Nobel Prize, gets exiled from the Soviet Union. I buy a book of his essays and I'm reading and I thought, good heavens, this guy's a Christian. I mean, and the newspapers only made him out to be a, a political dissident. 
really, oh, he's an Orthodox Christian. Not only that, but you dig a little deeper and you discover he returned to his Orthodox faith in the Gulag. And I thought, if he can come to faith in the Gulag, I will listen to him. I mean, that's not some sort of happy, clappy Pentecostalism. Jesus, bless me, glory to God, I'm an American, any good, you know. Oh, they're persecuting us. No. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, no, but you listen to the, and I met not only him, I mean, I, I met others who had been through these experiences, read their stuff and things like that, and it was like, this said to me, God is real. But I couldn't hear it from anybody who wasn't telling it to me from a cross. I didn't believe anybody else. Like, anybody can talk about God when their life is such a blessed American whatever. Show me somebody in a Soviet gulag who's just thanking God. Like you read the glory to God for all things, Akathist, written in the gulag. Boy, if you can praise God there, then it's true everywhere. And it, 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 it rescued me. I mean, I didn't answer all my questions. I just knew this, this is the path. And you know, eventually got on it, it became an Orthodox Christian. Well, I think actually that I'm tired and I probably ought to stop. So I love you all. I'm really, really honored to be here uh, and to have been able to share with you guys. And uh, so I will shortly be driving back down to Oak Ridge. You get down, you see the glow and you turn right. And it's, you know, so thank you.